Hi, I'm Alan Beaver. Welcome to this episode of Understanding Tort Law, the Law of Private Nuisance. In this episode, we're going to shift our focus from a previous discussion. In previous episodes, we were trying to figure out an answer to the question, when is something a nuisance? Right? We were trying to work out how you tell whether something is a nuisance or not. Now, the focus is going to be, if there is a nuisance, what should we do about it? Okay, so if there is a nuisance, if a nuisance has occurred, what should the response of the court be? And the way that this is conceptualized in law is to ask the question, what should the remedy be? Right, the idea here is that the plaintiff has suffered a wrong at the hands of the defendant, right? And the question is, how should that wrong be remedied? What should the remedy for that wrong be? Now, there are two kinds of situations that we might be facing. But on the one hand, it may be the case that the plaintiff is dealing with a past wrong, something that has happened in the past, a nuisance that has occurred in the past, and the plaintiff has suffered some loss as a result of that. Okay, the other, on the other hand, the situation may be that there's a nuisance that's going to continue into the future, right? and the plaintiff wants something to be done about the fact that the nuisance is going to continue into the future. Okay, now... These situations call for different kinds of response. They, uh, they uh, generate different kinds of issues. When we're dealing with a past wrong, the position is relatively clear. The position is that the plaintiff is entitled to damages. Okay, so something has happened in the past. It's a, it's a nuisance. It's an illegal thing that's happened in the past. I'm injured as a result of it. I'm entitled to compensation for the injury that I have suffered. Now that injury may be, for example, in the form of property damage. It may be that, you know, as, as in Hells NSO Petroleum, acid smuts and oily drops are damaging my property. I'm entitled to compensation for that damage to the property. It may be loss of amenity. So it may be, again, as in Hells NSO Petroleum, I haven't been able to sleep well at night. I'm entitled to money compensation for that. For us, this is relatively simple. I don't mean to say it's necessarily relatively simple in law. In fact, there's a whole area of law that deals with working out the amount of damage that uh, damages that a, a, a defendant would have to pay. It's called, rather unsurprisingly, the law of damages. And there are lots of interesting issues that arise in that area of the law. But as far as we're concerned at the moment, we don't really need to worry about this. You just need to know that the plaintiff is entitled to damages for a past wrong. Okay, it's much more complicated for us when we're dealing with a future wrong, a nuisance that's going to continue in the future. And the question then is what should be done about it? Now, it needs to be said here that of course, it's often the case that the plaintiff is suing for both. I mean, that is the event of which, or the, the thing about which, the activity about which the plaintiff is complaining is an activity that's occurred in the past and will continue into the future. In that case, the plaintiff is entitled to damages for the past wrong, but also wants something done about the future. Okay, now, <clears throat> so the question is, what should happen if the nuisance is going to continue into the future. Now you might think that there's a very simple answer to this. On the face of it, intuitively, there is a very simple answer to this. A nuisance is an illegal activity. If it's going to continue into the future, then it's obvious what the court should do. The court should stop it, right? And the court does so by issuing an injunction, that is an order from the court to the defendant to cease the activity. Okay, and that is indeed a normal response that courts give to ongoing nuisances. They'll say, stop, issue an injunction to prevent it from happening in the future. But as we'll see, there are some occasions where judges want to say, where courts have wanted to say, well, no, I don't think in this circumstance it would be appropriate to award an injunction. Okay, I don't think we should actually stop the nuisance continuing into, into the future. And there are even some judges, not many, in fact, maybe there's really only one, but, but maybe more than one, who has thought that we should actually never stop them. Right. <clears throat> now, to understand what's going on here completely, you need to understand something about the history of, the, of our legal system in particular, the history of the way in which equity and the common law relate to each other. 
Um, this is a really big topic and I think it's a very important one for understanding the law, but we're not going to look at it here. It's just too complicated to be dealt with in this particular context. But let's just, just say that uh, according to tradition, um, the plaintiff is entitled to damages as of right. Common law courts awarded damages and they awarded damages as of right. The plaintiff is entitled to damages as of right. So if there's been a past wrong, you go to court, you get damages. Okay, no problem. But the awarding of an the award of an injunction has historically been within the province of the courts of equity, and it was part of our understanding of equity that the courts acted with what was called what is still called discretion. And so the idea is that the award of an injunction is discretionary. The award of damages is as of right, but the award of an injunction is discretionary. Now, I personally, my, my own view is that this word discretion is a terrible word. It's the worst word that you could use to describe what's actually going on in these cases, Dis for, at least in, mo in the modern law. Discretion is not an accurate description of what's happening here. But nevertheless, it's the word that we use. And, you know, as always, we just have to get used to these funny words, you know, a, a nuisance that's not annoying, a negligence that's not carelessness, a, a battery that's a mere touching, and so on and so on. Okay, so I, I don't think, to understand what's going on, I don't think it's very helpful to think much about the, about the, word, the meaning of the word discretion. What we need to do is look at the cases and see what's actually going on there. But at least, you know, it helps to understand this. The courts have no leeway when it comes to the award of damages for, for past wrong, relatively. Whereas they have more leeway, at least, when it comes to the awarding of an injunction. Now the issue here, when we're dealing with future wrong, is the, is the, the idea is that it may be appropriate in some circumstances for judges not to award an injunction, but to award, as it were, compensation in advance. So it may be appropriate for judges to say to the plaintiff, look, I know that you're suffering from a nuisance. We're not going to stop the nuisance, but what we're going to do is compensate you in advance for the effect that the nuisance has upon you. And this is known as awarding damages in lieu of an injunction. Okay, awarding damages in lieu of an injunction, instead of an injunction, in place of an injunction, awarding damages as a replacement for giving an injunction. Right, and the idea is there may be some circumstances in which that would be appropriate, right, in which it would be appropriate to give the plaintiff damages instead of an injunction. Okay, and our first case to look at in this context a case from the end of the 19th century at Schaefer and City of London. Okay, so in this case, Lord Justice Smith lays out four rules for the awarding of damages in lieu of an injunction. He says, In my opinion, it may be stated as a good working rule that 1. If the injury to the plaintiff's legal right is small, 2. And is one which is capable of being estimated in money, 3 and is one which can be adequately compensated by a small money payment. 4. And the case is one which it would be oppressive to the defendant to grant an injunction, then damages in substitution for an injunction may be given. Okay, and here I have a slide that summarises the position taken by uh, uh, Lord Justice Smith. So, the injury to the plaintiff's legal rights must be small, it must be capable of being estimated in money. It must be able to be compensated adequately by a small money payment. And there, it has to be in circumstances where it would be oppressive to, to the defendant to grant an injunction. Now we need to notice here that all four of these conditions must be met according to this rule before it would be appropriate to award, award damages in lieu of an injunction. So all four of these things have to be true. Otherwise the plaintiff gets an injunction. It's only when all four of these things are true that damages are awarded instead of an injunction. Now, as you can see from these criteria, it, it won't often be the case that, uh, that all these criteria are met. It won't often be the case that one, two, three, and four are all true. I, I wouldn't say never. In fact, we're going to look at a case where I think it was true, where one, two, three, and four did hold. 
But in the vast majority of cases, one, two, three, and four won't all be true. And so it follows from the Schaefer rule that uh, it's almost never, not never, but almost never appropriate to award damages in lieu of an injunction. Okay, so an injunction is almost always appropriate according to the Schaefer rule. Now, the qu one question you might ask is well, why, when one and four is true, why would it then be appropriate to award damages in lieu of an injunction? And I think the answer to this is that in these circumstances, it is an adequate response to the plaintiff to award the plaintiff damages and it would be more a violation of the defendant's freedom than of the uh, to award an injunction than it would be a violation of the plaintiff's freedom to fail to award an injunction. Now, that's something you can think more about, but that's, I, th I think, the basis for the Schaefer rule. In, these, in this very unusual circumstance in which the Schaefer rule applies, the pl because, and be it's because the plaintiff can adequately be compensated with a small money payment, and because it would be oppressive to the defendant to award an injunction, it's actually more a violation of the defendant's freedom to impose the injunction than it would violate the plaintiff's freedom not to impose the injunction. Okay, so it's fair, but even though the defendant is engaged in an illegal activity, it is nevertheless in this circumstance, in this very odd circumstance, fair as between the parties not to award an injunction. And right at the end of this discussion, uh, we'll look at a case like that, what, what, what I think is like that. Bank of New Zealand and Greenwood is the name of the case. Anyway, another thing to say about uh, Lord Justice Smith's judgment is that even when one to four apply, there may be circumstances in which you should still award an injunction. Right? As he says, there may also be cases in which, though the above forementioned requirements exist, the defendant by his conduct, as for instance hurrying up his building so as if possible to avoid an injunction or otherwise acting with a reckless disregard to the plaintiff's rights, has disentitled himself from asking that damages may be assessed in substitution for an injunction. So here's the kind of case that, that uh, Lord Justice Smith has in mind. So imagine that the consequence of awarding an injunction is that the the defendant will have to demolish a built structure. So let's say the defendant has built some structure on his property that is causing a nuisance uh, to the plaintiff. Let's say it's, it's, damage. it's causing a small amount of damage to the plaintiff's property. right? And the only way to stop that from happening is to cause the defendant to dismantle the structure entirely. And you might think that's a pretty, that's a pretty oppressive thing to do to the defendant. If it's just a small amount of damage to the plaintiff, that's quite an oppressive thing to do. So that might be a case where you would award damages in lieu of an injunction. But imagine what happened is that the, we know, for example, that the defendant built this structure uh, knowing that it was going to cause damage, and he built it while the plaintiff was away on holiday, and, um, so that the plaintiff didn't know about it, and he, he rushed it, he made it he quickly, built it as quickly as possible, so that it would be finished before the plaintiff could come back and complain about it. In that kind of circumstances, you might say, well, given the conduct of the defendant, we're still going to make him dismantle the structure, right? <clears throat> even though under normal circumstances it would be oppressive to do so, because the defendant has acted in a way that has disentitled him from making the claim that damages should be awarded in lieu of an injunction. Now, it's important to notice that this, ex uh, this exception works one way only. What uh, Lord Justice Smith is saying is that there may be circumstances in which one to four are all true and yet it would not be appropriate to award damages in lieu of an injunction. He's not saying the reverse. He's not saying there may be cases where one to four are not true, where you know maybe only one, two and three are true, but four isn't, where it would be appropriate to award damages in lieu of an injunction. You never award damages in lieu of an injunction unless one to four are all true. And even then, there may be circumstances where you still would award an injunction and not damages in lieu of an injunction. Okay, now 
One of the most important things about the shape for all that needs to be brought out now, it's an implication of the shape for all, it's not explicitly in the rule, but it's really important implication of the shape for all is that the public interest is not a relevant reason. Because the public interest is not mentioned in one to four, it, the public interest is not a reason for refusing to give an injunction according to the Schaefer rule. But as we'll see, that position comes under a certain amount of pressure in future cases. Okay, so our next case is Bamford and Turnley, a, a very important decision. Uh, and here again we meet our friend Baron Bramwell. So in this case, the plaintiff alleges that uh, the noise emanating from an adjacent brick-making operation is intolerable. Now, the defendant admits that ordinarily this is the kind of thing that would be a nuisance, but the defendant replies that his brick-making operation is in the public interest and so therefore cannot be a nuisance. Now, in support of this claim, the defendant points to other activities that aren't nuisances, but on the face of it look as if they ought to be nuisances, and the defendant says the reason that these things are not nuisances is because they are in the public interest. And so the defendant says, if you look at the case law and think about it, you can see that there is actually a public interest defence here. Uh, and you should apply that defence in our case too. The defendant points to things uh, such as uh, burning weeds. So in the England of the day, if you had, you know, you, you, you weeds, what did you do with the weeds? Well, you burnt them, and that would cause there to be smoke, and that would annoy the neighbours. Uh, emptying cesspools, so people had septic tanks, and these septic tanks had to be emptied. If you've ever been around a septic tank when it gets emptied, you know that this is something that can con cause significant inconvenience. Uh, to neighbours. People need to repair their houses, right, they need to repair their houses and that cause, causes noise as well as other possible disturbance to neighbours, like dust drifting over onto the property and so forth. So these things happen, we, and the courts let them happen. I mean, if my, if my, you know, if I live, even now, if I live in a part of uh, the country where there isn't a, a, a sewage system and I have to have a, a cesspool, a septic tank, septic system we call them, at least in New Zealand, um, so every once in a while they'll need to be emptied. And when they get emptied, they will cause annoyance to my neighbours. But if my neighbour tries to sue me for nuisance to prevent that from happening, my neighbour will not succeed. Okay, so I need to conduct repairs on my house sometimes. That's going to be annoying to my neighbour. But if my neighbour tries to sue me to prevent that from happening, my neighbour will not succeed. Why not? Why not? The defendant says, ah, that's because these activities are in the public interest. It's because they're in the public interest that the, uh, that the uh, p potential defendants are allowed to continue with them. And so please, apply that same defence to us. We're making bricks. It's in the public interest. People use these bricks to build houses, to build factories, to build, you know, whatever, useful things. Right? What we're doing is publicly useful, and so we should be allowed to continue. Okay. <clears throat> now... This argument fails, and the question is why? Exactly why does the argument fail? Here's what Bram Baron Bramwell says. First of all, he says, for the defendant's argument to succeed, they have to argue that their activity was not a nuisance. They can't argue that it was a nuisance, but they should be forgiven for it, because it was in the public interest. They seem very close to, at least very close, to arguing that, saying, look, it is a nuisance, we accept that what we're doing is a nuisance, but it's in the public interest, and so we should be forgiven. Bramwell says you can't run that argument. Why not? Because a nuisance is, by definition, an illegal activity. If you were committing a nuisance, you were doing something illegal, and we as a court cannot say that you were doing something illegal, but that's okay, <laughs> right? So what you have to argue is not you're doing something illegal, but you should be forgiven for it. You have to argue that what you're doing is not illegal. 
So what you have to argue in this case is that the public interest shows that you are not committing a nuisance. Right? You have to argue that given what we are doing is in the public interest, it isn't a nuisance to do it. Okay, and then the question is, is that argument going to work? Is the plaintiff able, to, uh, sorry, is the defendant able to argue that what they're doing is not illegal because what they're doing is in the public interest? Well, here is the principle that Bramwell uses to determine this question. Unfortunately, it's a rather long passage, but it's very much worth reading. He says, there must be then some principle upon which such cases must be accepted. These, these are the cesspool case, the repairs to the house case, the burning the weeds case. There must be some principle upon which those cases are accepted. That is, those cases are revealed not to be nuisances. What could that principle be? He says, It seems to me that that principle may be deduced from the character of these cases, and it is this, namely that those acts necessary for the common and ordinary use and occupation of land and houses may be done, if conveniently done, without subjecting those who do them to an action. This principle would comprehend all the cases I have mentioned, but would not comprehend the present, where what has been done was not the using of land in a common and ordinary way, but in an exceptional manner, not unnatural nor unusual, but not the common and ordinary use of land. There is an obvious necessity for such a principle, as I have mentioned. It is as much for the advantage of one owner as of another, for the very nuisance the one complains of, as the result of the ordinary use of his neighbour's land, he himself will create in the ordinary use of his own, and the reciprocal nuisances are of a comparatively trifling character. The convenience of such a rule may be indicated by calling it a rule of give and take live and let live. Okay, the first thing to note here is Bramwell's appeal to a standard of ordinary versus extraordinary use. We've seen this sort of idea in different places. We've talked about general versus particular, fundamental versus peripheral, and now we've got ordinary and extraordinary. I think that these are all, all ways of trying to capture the same basic idea. On Lord Bramwell's view, ordinary uses of land trump extraordinary ones. If, if we're complaining about each other's activity, or you're complaining about my activity, who wins? The person whose use of land is more ordinary than the other person's. Okay, it does... It doesn't have to be an unusual use of land to be a nuisance. It doesn't have to be an unnatural use of land to be a nuisance. It doesn't have to be immoral to be a nuisance. There's nothing wrong with making bricks, right? There's nothing wrong with it. There is nothing unreasonable about making bricks, right? But what makes it illegal is the comparison. It's the fact that it's interfering with a more fundamental, I would say, more fundamental activity uh, of the plaintiffs. Okay, now <clears throat> let's then talk about this law of live and let live, give and take. Okay, now many people have interpreted this passage to be an appeal to the public interest. Right, so they say, you know, the defendant appeals to the public interest as a defence, and then along comes Bramwell, and he kind of agrees. He says, yeah, 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 um, the reason that we allow cesspools to be emptied and weeds to be burned is because of uh, the public interest. But I think this is entirely wrong. There is no appeal to the public interest here at all. What Bramwell is in fact appealing to is a principle of consistency. He is saying you can't complain of an activity that the defendant is performing if you are going to have to perform that same activity yourself. So think about it this way. I'm, I'm living in a community where we all have septic tanks. Uh, I can't complain when my neighbour empties his septic tank because in the future I'm going to have to empty my septic tank. right? I can't complain when my neighbour conducts ordinary repairs to his house because later I'm going to have to conduct these kind of repairs to my house too. So what's been appealed, there's nothing to do with the public interest. The appeal there is to a principle of consistency. It's a basic principle of fairness, right, that I can't complain about 
you doing something that I myself am going to do in the future. Right here, this is a principle of consistency, a principle of fairness that is under consideration here. The rule of live and let live, give and take, is a principle of fairness. If this means anything to anyone, it's got a lot to do with Kantian universalization. Right? You can't consistently will a law uh, that, the, that the defendant not do something when you're going to do that thing itself. Anyway, don't, don't worry about it. If that doesn't mean anything to you, don't worry about it. But it, it just may be enlightening for some people. Okay, anyway, the point is, it's nothing to do with the public interest. It's a basic principle of fairness. Now, we've seen this before. We've seen this before in other cases, like, for example, in Fontainebleau. In Fontainebleau, the court held that the plaintiff was not entitled to complain about the defendant building up, when, after all, the plaintiff had already built up and no doubt would want to conduct uh, some kind of extensions or renovations or whatever in the future as well. Okay, all right, so... What Bramwell says is, look, all those cases that you appeal to, defendant, to bolster your argument that the public interest is a defence, these don't work because these cases are not based on the public interest. The reason that people are allowed to empty their cesspools, burn weeds or conduct repairs is nothing to do with the public interest. It's based on a principle of consistency. right? And so you can't appeal to these cases to support your claim. Now, that doesn't show that there isn't or shouldn't be a public interest defence. It just shows that these cases can't be used to support the existence of such a defence. Bramwell then goes on to discuss whether there is and should be, or is or should be, a public interest defence. This is what he says. But it is said that, temporary or permanent, it is lawful because it is for the public benefit. Now, in the first place, that law, to my mind, is a bad one, which, for the public benefit, inflicts loss on an individual without compensation. Just in passing here, compare this. This is very similar to the decision of, uh, of, uh, Lord, uh, of Justice Lafare in Talk that we looked at earlier, although Bramwell's using it to argue for a quite different conclusion, as we'll see. But further, with great respect, I think this consideration misapplied in this and in many other cases. The public consists of all the individuals of it, and a thing is only for the public benefit when it is productive of good to those individuals on the balance of loss and gain to all, so that if all the loss and all the gain were borne and received by one individual, he on the whole would be a gainer. But whenever this is the case, whenever a thing is for the public benefit properly understood, the loss to the individuals of the public who lose will bear compensation out of the gains of those who gain. It is for the public benefit that there should be railways, but it would not be unless the gain of having the railway was sufficient to compensate the loss occasioned by the use of the land required for its site, and accordingly no one thinks it would be right to take an individual's land without compensation to make a railway. It is for the public benefit that trains should run, but not unless they pay their expenses. If one of those expenses is the burning down of a wood of such value that the railway owners would not run the train and burn down the wood if it were their own, neither is it for the public benefit that, that they should, since if the wood is not their own. If, though, the wood were their own, they would still find it, co find it compensated them to run trains at the cost of burning the wood, then they, would obvi then they obviously ought to compensate the owner of such wood not being themselves, if they burn it down and making their gains. Now, unfortunately, that's perhaps not as uh, transparent as it ought to be, but I think that the argument that Bramwell's making is actually quite simple and very powerful. The argument can be summarised like this. So the defendant claims that, though it would otherwise be a nuisance, he should be permitted to continue his activity because it is in the public interest. Now, Bramwell says there are two possible situations. In situation one, the defendant gains less from his activity than the plaintiff's loses. So the, the, the plaintiff's loss is bigger than the defendant's gain. In this case, Bramwell says it can't really be that the defendant's activity was in the public interest. In fact, the defendant's activity is not in the public interest. It's causing more damage than good. So in that situation, the public interest argument is irrelevant. Right, because this is not a situation in which the defendant's activity actually is in the public interest. 
The second situation too is when the defendant gains more than the plaintiff's lo plaintiff loses. So you know the defendant loses something, but the defendant gains a lot more, or, or at least more, than the than the plaintiff loses. In this case, Bramwell says yes, the defendant's activity is in the public interest. However, in this case, when the defendant is gaining more than the plaintiff is losing, the defendant can afford to compensate the plaintiff for the plaintiff's losses. Now again, the consequence of this is that the public interest argument is irrelevant. The point that Bramwell is making is that if it really is in the public interest, then the defendant can afford to compensate the plaintiff. And so the consequence of this must be that public interest arguments are actually irrelevant. Okay, so think about that in this case. We have a, a defendant manufacturing bricks and a plaintiff suffering a loss as a result of the defendant's manufacture of bricks. The defendant says, you should allow me to continue because my behaviour, my activity, is in the public interest. Uh, Bramwell says, well, it, is it really in the public interest? If it is in the public interest for you to continue to be making those bricks, you must be gaining more from making the bricks than the plaintiff is losing. Right? I mean, if it's really a great thing for the public that you're doing, that you're making these bricks, obviously you're going to get paid well for making those bricks. If people really want those bricks, if bricks are really valuable to people, then people are going to pay you well for making those bricks. And you should be able to take that money and compensate the plaintiff with it. So, so the public interest argument can't actually argue against liability. Right? If it's not in the public interest, then the argument's irrelevant. If it is in the public interest, then the defendant can afford to compensate the plaintiff. It's also irrelevant. Okay, <clears throat> so the result of this is that according to the position advanced by Baron Bramwell in this case, public interest arguments are necessarily irrelevant. They can't ever give us a reason for finding the defendant not liable. If it's not in the public interest what the defendant is doing, then the public interest arguments obviously don't provide a reason for re rejecting liability. If what the defendant is doing is in the public interest, right, then the defendant can afford to compensate the plaintiff. So again, we don't have a reason for refusing to impose liability. Now there's a wrinkle here, and that is, what, a, what about when dealing with an injunction? <laughs> So on the one hand, you might think about, yeah, okay, imposing liability. But if the, the problem for the defendant here is that the defendant's behavior is in the public interest and you award an injunction, then it's not, the, the consequence is not that the defendant will have to compensate the plaintiff. The consequence is that the defendant will have to stop. But that's wrong. <clears throat> and it's really important to see that that's wrong. It's very tempting as a lawyer especially, to think that the consequence of an injunction being awarded by the court in this case is that the defendant will necessarily have to stop producing bricks, right? And it's, you can see why we would think this. The, the court says, defendant, stop making the noise, stop producing, you know, you'll have to stop producing bricks. That's the court order. That's the injunction. End of story. But it's not the end of the story because even after the injunction is awarded, it's still possible for the parties to negotiate. Okay, so let's say the court awards an injunction to the defendant that stops the defendant from producing any further bricks. The def defendant can then go to the plaintiff and say, okay, look, I understand you've got this injunction. Can we offer you some money? Can we come to an agreement? Perhaps I can buy your land, whatever. They can come to some arrangement right? According to, that would allow the defendant to continue. Right? The court order, the injunction, is not the end of the matter. The parties are still free people. They're able to negotiate in the light of the injunction that the court has produced. Some judges actually hate this. They think that their word should be the final say in everything, but that's not the way our system works. That's not the way our economy works. These people are free economic agents and they are able to negotiate to alter the position that on the face of it has been produced by the court.
So in this case, it could be, for example, that the court awards an injunction and then the parties negotiate between themselves and come to an acceptable arrangement, acceptable to both of them, right? That means that the defendant can continue to operate. But that would be for the parties to decide. Okay, and if again, if it really is in the public interest for the defendant to continue to manufacture bricks, it ought to be the case that the defendant will be able to offer the plaintiff a deal that the plaintiff would accept. And we need to keep this point in mind as we examine further cases. Okay, and next case, Sturges and Bridgman.